uh, looking at maybe perhaps the future of dermatopathology, how to survive, and, and what's going on. So we did open a new laboratory not too long ago. Uh, about a year ago, actually, we just celebrated our one-year anniversary. And so just a little bit about my history, where I came from. Um, I moved to Texas uh, in 1988 and joined my former uh, uh, late uh, uh, associate, Dr. Robert Freeman, who had actually been there since 1972. Uh, we originally were with UT Southwestern, and because of various pressures, we decided to, to move along and, and open our own practice uh, in 1992. Uh, at the time, there was a, a lot of uh, the, the whole managed care world was happening then. A lot of you younger guys, uh, you probably take managed care for granted, but back in the early 90s, managed care was coming on like this, this big uh, leviathan, and we didn't know what it was going to do. Uh, we were getting letters from large uh, providers saying, well, uh, your, your services are no longer needed for 100,000 people or whatever they are, and it, just, it scared the heck out of us, to be honest with you. And so we didn't know what to do at the time. Nobody really did. So we decided to join up with other like-minded dermatopathology labs and also pathology labs and form this company, Ameripath. And we stayed with them for, for quite a while. Uh, and actually, then that was, went kind of through a roller coaster of being owned by a private equity firm. Uh, eventually, it was sold to Quest Diagnostics. And then we finally decided to go back out on our own. And uh, this is a little article that was published in the Dallas Business Journal about us uh, around the time we decided to do this. So why did we decide to go private? Well, you listen to the news and medicine is going down the tubes and you're going to be poor and you're going to be working, you're going to be slaves and ACA and yada, yada. So why do we decide to, to do that? Uh, well, we did it twice. We actually did it back in 1993, and then we went with Ameripath, and we decided to do back after our Quest uh, relationship. So, again, uh, this was the advent of managed care back then. Uh, what was interesting to us, we, it, we used to be with UT Southwestern Medical School, and I know some of you in the room are probably with academic medical centers, and that's great, but... Uh, what would happen is a managed care plan would come and say, well, we're negotiating prices for you, and uh, you're charging $5,000 for a neurosurgical procedure, but we're only going to reimburse that at, uh, at $2,500. But your dermatopathology that's charging $50, well, well, we'll we'll pay all of that. That's fine. We don't want to cut them. But uh, so the UT Southwestern guys would say, wait a minute, we can't afford to have our neurosurgical guys cut like that, so we're just not going to contract with you. So they say, fine, well, you don't get the derm path work either. So one size didn't fit all with us. So we decided that we had to leave or we were going to see our practice just be devastated uh, in essence. So that, that can happen if you're with a large group, just so you're, you're aware those kind of things do happen. So we decided to go to Amer with Ameripath. Uh, basically, that we were hoping that as a group, uh, we'd be able to kind of negotiate uh, managed care, contracting things better. Uh, our sort of uh, goal or my sort of motto at the time was, well, as numbers, they're a strength. I didn't feel comfortable being a little solo practitioner with all these things happening. So we did join up with them. Uh, well, how did it work? So if you ever get approached by somebody who wants to buy you or, or take you over, um, it was very volatile for a number of years. Uh, it was a startup, so there were a lot of issues. Uh, things were centralized in Florida. They didn't really understand the Texas market very well. Uh, there was a lot of variable talent. Uh, some were great and some were horrible, uh, as is true in any large company. But um, it was a lot. And, and once the company went public, well, then there was significant pressure to meet these quarterly expectations. So that became important, more so than just patient care. So nothing against large companies, but they do tend to look at those things, believe it or not, and, and it filters down to the guy sitting behind the microscope. Uh, there also was an issue with uh, Medicare fraud. It turned out to be false, but when that happened, uh, this company was on the newswire that day, and the stock dropped from like 15 down to one in one day, and it was really uh, stressful uh, at that time for that company. So anyway, never really uh, uh, sort of uh, recuperated from that, if you will. Uh, so this company, a private equity firm, Welsh Carson, uh, Anderson and Stowe came in and they said, well, this company uh, is a good company and we can buy this and we can improve it and then we can turn it into something bigger. And uh, that's what they did do. Um, these were some of the smartest people that I ever worked with. They were very good business people and good talent. Uh, instead of coming in and telling you what, what to do, they came in with a yellow pad asking questions, which is a good thing. So they were, they were interested. But at the end of the day, they're, they're deal guys. They want to they take something, fix it up, sell it, and move on. And so they just happen to have our industry in the, in the crosshairs. And, and uh, they did very well on their sale. So uh, again, we wish them the very best. Uh, they sold it to this group, uh, Quest Diagnostics. And uh, they're a good company. They're a multi-billion dollar company, but they're based mainly on blood testing rather than anatomic pathology. And uh, the vision that the former CEO, who unfortunately kind of lost his job because of this whole deal, uh, was to have a gr good group of high-quality pathology people like 
me and a few people in this room uh, to actually be sort of the anatomic pathology uh, uh, side of excellence, if you will, to go along with the blood testing. And so uh, uh, it was a good idea. Uh, but unfortunately, it, it suffered from a lot of the advantages of being in a giant corporation, and it just ultimately didn't really work very well. And, uh, and it actually is, is not turned out to be as good of a deal as we had all hoped. So unfortunately, it was not, not great, at least for our practice. So uh, we decided to sort of at the end of our contract to just kind of go back out on our own. So that's kind of where we were. Well, what's different today than in 1993? Well, um, you know, back in those days, there really were no multi-lab uh, companies like there are today. Those were just kind of beginning. Uh, there's been managed care and insurance consolidation. There's really only a few large insurance companies today. Back in those days, there were a lot of insurance companies, and they could kind of compete with themselves. Um, there's been a commoditization of pathology. Anatomic pathology is no longer considered as much of a diagnostic procedure between doctors as a consultation. It's almost looked at more like a blood test. So all of these people that, that pay, that, that you, you know, that, that do these uh, calculations of how much things cost, well, they, they kind of consider it uh, in some ways to be a loss leader. They're interested in the blood testing revenue, but they're not as interested in what we do. And that's not good because, unfortunately, it, it, it causes uh, quality to kind of go down the tube. Um, loyalty. Uh, not ain't what it used to be either. I mean, there are a lot of physician practices now. They've been pressured on their own. And they're kind of using, uh, so, well, hey, I send you a 1,000 specimens. I want the cheapest price you can give me. Or, you know, hey, wait a minute. If you do that, you have to buy me a computer because I'm sending my specimens to you or things like that. That wasn't in practice when I started out. Uh, that, that, that wasn't there, but that's definitely there today. And, uh, the, and a couple of years ago until the end of last year, you could actually give a donation for an EMR. And a lot of these companies would come in and give $100,000. Uh, and they say, well, okay, now you, you can't, I can't force you to send the, the material to me. But, of course, you will, right, because you love me because I gave you all this money. So, so there are heart strings attached, even though legally uh, there can't be uh, uh, strings attached, but they, there are. Believe me, there are. Uh, computers. Again, we have a computer uh, company that's displaying here with us. We appreciate that. And, uh, but in some cases, believe it or not, those are actually more important than the diagnoses. Uh, they, the clinicians want these computers. They're used to these PDAs now, and they expect them to work all the time. They want them customized. Um, they don't want KA. They want margins and some things, all this stuff. You've got to be a mind reader when you're reading cases today. Uh, that isn't the way it used to be. And of course, there are people out there that are copycats and more government control. And unfortunately, that's coming, going away. And we have more biopsies being performed by non-people uh, trained in derm. Uh, I know there's some non-dermatologists and non-physicians in this room, but you're learning and you're, you're doing the right thing. There are a lot of guys out there that have no knowledge of dermatology and they're doing biopsies and they, they send in specimen like this with no information. <laughs> so uh, you can really do good clinical pathologic correlation. We don't even get any clinical. So, or they'll just put a number down or something like that. So unfortunately, we're getting a lot of that. We're getting lousier and lousier biopsies with less and less information. So this is a good example. I got a, a Goomba and he sends us something like this. And, and all these wry laughs in the room. Well, this really and truly happens, unfortunately. This is actually a lawsuit uh, that I'm involved in, believe it or not, uh, that uh, was alleged that we missed a squamous cell, and this is the material we got. So, you know, anyway, it didn't show us. So said, this is an obvious squamous cell. It's just a little focus of inflammation here. So uh, this paper was published by Wilma Bergfeld uh, in the uh, archive, the well, JAMA Dermatology now, talking about the incredibly vanishing biopsy. And, and now even if you cut deeper into it, you don't get, uh, get information. So, so given all those negative factors, why in the world did we decide to go out and open up on our own and do something crazy like this? Well, you know, for us, the corporate medicine was not a hands-off situation, and, and I, I'm kind of a, I'm from Texas, you know, I believe in the Alamo and all this stuff, and so I really didn't enjoy being an employee. I'm pretty independent, and so uh, I, I, it wasn't fun for me, especially the last several years of being with um, this corporate business, so I didn't like people telling me what to do. I figured, I'd, as my office manager said, I said, well, look, if we go out on our own, we're going to have our own set of problems. There are going to be a lot of problems. She's, yeah, but they'll be our problems. So she's right. She, I don't know if she regrets saying that now, but, but she did say that at the time. Um, basically, when we were with the corporate group, we had all the problems of a private practice. And we're at the university, by the way. All of the problems of a private practice with a whole layer of bureaucracy on top of that. And I remember Dr. Freeman uh, one time was saying in, in, when he was at Baylor back in the 60s, he was in the doctor's lounge talking. And uh, uh, <laughs> he was talking about uh, with, with a private practitioner 
And they're sitting there saying, oh, you guys in academics, you don't have to worry about anything. You know, it's like being a school teacher. You know, we're out in private practice with all these difficult problems and all this kind of stuff. He says, yeah, you be an academic. You got all those same things, and then your chairman leaves, and they do all this, that, and the other, and they tax you and all this. So it's really true. You got everything in a private practice, practice world, but then it's just layered onto you in many cases in the academic world or in a corporate world. So uh, we were, you know, they weren't really interested in our vision. They were interested in quarterly earnings more. And, uh, you know, some people in the business really just, they just didn't really treat us like real people. There were all these fiefdoms and all these uh, little corporate politics that were going on. Uh, so, again, we just never really felt listened to and felt it was kind of time to move out on our own. This is our personal mission statement for our business. So this is what we use. And I've got this in our, on our wall. I've got it on some paperwork. And we're going to get our employees behind this. So this is a good mission statement. We have it. We believe in it. And, and this conference is part of the mission. You know, we're trying to provide the highest quality care and, and treat people through education and whatnot. So, so we live this mission statement. It wasn't an easy decision. Probably the hardest decision I'd ever made in my life uh, was to leave academics. I mean, you, it's kind of like the umbilical cord. You know, you're, you're sort of addicted to academics. You can't leave. Oh, I'm going to be now uh, in, the, in the practice world. I'm not going to have the uh, ivory tower sort of approach and all this stuff. So, and I've been listening to that for many, many years. So it was not easy. I remember uh, it really was a tough thing to do. Uh, and then to leave the corporate medicine issue was, was, was not easy either. I mean, uh, I was worried about all sorts of uh, legal issues and whatnot. Uh, but I was a little older then, and, and uh, it was really more of a lateral transfer than a major career change. This was a major career change. This was more of a lateral transfer. But still, there are a lot of issues that were going on out there. Uh, what's worked for us, uh, and hopefully maybe if you're going to do this, maybe it'll work for you. Uh, get the best talent you can. Uh, recruiting has been very good. Um, again, uh, we wanted to get back to more personalized service, more of a family-oriented kind of approach dealing with our doctors, uh, developing good relationships, uh, developing relationships with the managed care people. Uh, we, we don't want to make them demonized. Uh, we want to want to make them feel like we want to work with them, and that it's a win-win. It's hard educating them for that, but that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we've had the freedom to make decisions quickly, uh, and again, trying to do uh, personalized ancillary services. These are some of the members of our team, or Andy Wills, who's sitting in the back there. Um, he's an attractive man. Uh, he's a fellow that uh, we were in Japan together, and uh, uh, we were in Japan actually at the uh, invitation of the Sakura people, who we'll talk about in just a moment. Brand McCarley, you've seen him. I don't know if he's in the room here, but uh, he is. I, I, I can't tell you. I can't thank him enough for the work that he's done. We should owe him a, a, a an applause because he's helped put this uh, conference on, and he's worked his tail off. Um, his wife is still married to him, so that's, uh, she actually came here uh, to the meeting. So uh, anyway, he, he's, he's been a great asset for us, and he uh, was formerly at Dermpath, and he worked for me for a long time. We've got good legal uh, people working for us. Mark Vaselli is around here somewhere. He's probably not in the room. I think he's out enjoying the uh, uh, Vail Valley with his family. His family's up here. He was former director of health plans in Ameripath, and he's been a very, very important person for us to have. Um, when I came, went out on my own in 1993, I didn't have Mark Vaselli. I didn't have anybody like Mark Vaselli. So I was constantly on the phone myself calling these guys and trying to educate them and get our doctors galvanized to, to fight the managed care battles. Well, he's a pro at it, and he, he's got great relationships. And so if you're going to be doing this on your own, you need a Mark Vaselli type person. He's not on the market, but you need someone like him <laughs> in your practice. Um, so what have been the biggest challenges for us so far? By far the biggest, uh, believe it or not, has been the computer business. Um, I didn't realize that I was going to be, uh, you know, 1-800-GEEK, whatever that thing is, uh, when I opened my practice. Now I'm constantly working with offices. Uh, we've got uh, Aguilera. i got a slide about them in a minute. They've been extremely helpful uh, with this IT. Uh, but, but guys now, boy, they want that computer to work and they expect you to fix it if it doesn't work. They, it, it's a different paradigm, and this wasn't there in the old days where we could just, you know, I had a doctor a few, about, well, about 10 years ago as a client, I said, well, you know, we could get, you could get a fax machine and we could fax it to you. He's in South Carolina. I said, no, I don't want it faxed to me. It'll get here too fast if you do that, you know? I said, okay. <laughs> so I want you to put it in the mail. So we mailed all of his to him. He didn't want it fast. Uh, but today, everybody wants it lightning fast. They want it yesterday, and they want it to go right into that computer, and they pull it up, and there it is, and it's waiting for them. And I tell you, that's, that's been the hardest issue that we've had to deal with for sure. Um, 
actually, and one thing I did different, I'll talk about in a minute, was uh, we, got, we actually got into the building business because I, I got sick and tired of paying people for, my, for leases over the years, so we decided to actually buy a building, and that's been an interesting experience as well. Um, and again, some negative uh, press from others where people heard that I was leaving and they said, oh boy, now we can really go out there and badmouth Dr. Cockrell. He, we're going to tell everybody he's retiring and he's going to move to Colorado or go out to California and live on his winery, you know, all this stuff. So uh, but we had people telling me that all the time. I said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm still reading lots of cases every day. I'm not going anywhere. And then, of course, everything you read about in the press, well, careful about that. So uh, I may be a cockeyed optimist. Mitzi Gaynor, and uh, this is from South Pacific. She's got that song about I may be a cockeyed optimist. Well, I do still believe, maybe I am crazy, but if you provide the best service and work hard and really like what you're doing and have a good dedicated team, you're going to be successful at the end of the day. I, I just really believe that in my bones. I really think it's you got to believe that. If you don't, you shouldn't even be in the field. And I do believe that vision is the most important thing. I had a guy a few years ago at Ameripath who said, well, you know, cash is king. I said, well, if that's king, then service is God because you've got to provide service in this business, and that's what we're doing. We're here to provide service. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, you'd better be efficient and lean, okay? So be prepared. The reimbursements are lower than they used to be, and we'll talk tomorrow morning about maybe some ways to kind of help yourself in that regard. Uh, that's been another thing that I've had in my mind for a long time. You better be willing to work hard so you can't say, well, I'm only going to read five cases a day and go to the golf course. If you're going to go to the golf course, you better read 500 cases first. You know, So you better be willing to work hard. You better become a sales and marketing maniac. I told Brand that he's uh, now working for a maniac with a mission. So um, you better be prepared to be a salesman if you're in this business because you got to get out there and work on your own and, and bust your rear end. Uh, you better be prepared to face all these adversaries and because they're going to happen. You got to look for strategic alliances. Find people that that are, are they, they got the same issue. Uh, and get the best people and and finally, this is very important. You got to be grateful for what you do have. I remember Dr. Freeman telling me that years ago. Uh, I was going in there kind of fretting and fuming about all this stuff one time. He said, well, you know, one thing I always learned is just to look at the bottom line and say, you know, I'm really glad I have what I have. And I've always remembered that. And, and uh, there's actually, we had a guy uh, at a conference we were involved in last spring. Uh, his name was uh, Robert Ellis. Uh, he gave a, a beautiful talk on gratitude. He actually is a Ph.D. that studies positive psychology. And we had him come out and talk about gratitude for, for doctors and what. And it was really interesting. So there is a whole gratitude website that you can go to and learn about, about gratitude. Uh, one other thing I've learned is that there are always gloom and doom naysayers. You can turn on the TV. If you want to hear bad news, man, you can OD on that if you want to. It's, it's out there. Uh, so, but just you got to be aware of, of fear of having uh, fear be your major motivation for doing anything, okay? So you see all this stuff in the newspaper, uh, chicken little, the sky's falling. I've practiced my entire career worried about lawsuits, Medicare audits, fraud investigation. But haven't we all? Wouldn't it be Shangri-La if we didn't have to worry about that stuff, that we could just be practice medicine like my granddad did and Medicare didn't exist and all that stuff? Well, that's not the way it is. So you just got to tune that stuff out and just keep your eye on the vision. You just got to forge ahead or you're just going to basically stagnate. So anyway, I was lucky. Most of my clients, a lot of them in this room, and I really appreciate the loyalty that you, you've had for me over the years. They stayed with me. It was, it was a rough transition. Uh, putting in 75 computers in three or four weeks uh, wasn't an easy thing to do. Uh, and we had a, uh, a re-contract, re-credential, and all this kind of stuff. Um, I did decide to get into a building. I'll show you some pictures of that. And I've got my good friend and architect back in the room, Bob Sutter, that helped out with that. Uh, again, I, want, I said, well, if I'm going to have to deal with all these pressures of reimbursing and everything, maybe I need to take a look at real estate and some other ways to kind of help me out. So we can talk about some of that tomorrow morning as well. Uh, it's been an interesting challenge. I've never really been in the real estate business before. These are some drawings uh, that Bob uh, did, and he, Bob has got a, a beautiful display out here as well. If you're thinking of doing any kind of architectural work, e even in the corporate world, guys, I would recommend him. He's done stuff not just for doctors. He's done stuff for, uh, what you think, like a, a building in New York. I mean, he's done all kinds of things. So if you need architecture, I can't recommend this guy enough. He's really spectacular. So this is before and this is after. We got our, so this is coming to, into, into fruition. We've got our name on the building, got our little logo up there. Um, these are what it looked like before. And John Breen, who's been taking all these pictures, uh, came in and took some photos uh, before and after. I mean, this thing really looked like a dump when we got it. And uh, this is, uh, these are some of the, the schematic drawings. Uh, Randy uh, Wills is an expert at building laboratories. He's built laboratories all over the world. 
and uh, he's, he came in and helped us uh, set this whole lab up. This is what our offices are looking like. We're getting ready to move down from our second floor temporary space into this sometime next month. And we're going to have a, a teaching room with a multi-edit scope, with video conferencing, uh, chairs. So if you ever want to come visit our lab for an educational seminar, we're going to have this available in the near future. So uh, we're really making an educational uh, place. And this is the lab in action. We actually got this thing done uh, in about six weeks once the building, the shell, was ready. We put all this stuff in, got all the equipment, and put it to work. And uh, uh, I am going to make a plug for Sakura and Leica. These guys have been great supporters of us. Uh, this Sakura thing is really phenomenal. They have a really, really good technology we'll talk about in a minute. These are some other pictures of the, of the finished space. This is going to be the multi-edit scope. It's going to go in this room. This is our break room. This is all Bob Sutter's work. I mean, it's really just beautiful, and I, I just can't recommend him, him enough. Um, uh, we, so we were able to form some really good uh, relationships with lab companies. Randy was very helpful with this. So this Sakura company has got, in my opinion, some of the best lab equipment in the world. They have auto stainers, cover slippers, high-speed processors. It used to take a, like uh, uh, 24 hours or more to process tissue that would come in, even a punch biopsy. This, uh, this high-speed processor can do this in about an hour. And uh, so you can get a rush case on an erythromultiforme kind of case, something like that. We can, be, we can be reading that in an hour on formal and fixed tissue, which is pretty amazing. Uh, they also have an automatic embedder. We were able to, to cut back on the number of people we needed to hire and bring over by about 30% by getting all of this automized equipment. It's been extremely valuable for us. And Leica, uh, very helpful with us for immunohistology. Uh, we're going to be getting one of these Aperio slide scanners. That's uh, a Leica pre uh, technology, which is also going to be helpful. We can look at slides anywhere around the world. Uh, we have WinSurge as a lab informatic system. And then Aguilar, uh, these guys are here. Medhat uh, is in the back of the room. Justin Wills, who's been helping with that. These guys, again, given the fact that we had to be a computer company in addition to a lab company, uh, they were super helpful with us with these EMR interfaces, this corporate, this customized infrastructure. Uh, we even flew Justin out to North Carolina one time to help out with a, an issue in a laboratory. So these guys were super helpful. Uh, MedSpeed, our couriers have been helpful. We have Orion, they're here as billing. If you need any kind of billing service, I can recommend these guys very well. They had some issues initially understanding our business. Now it's really very uh, smoothly well-tuned. And then our, our lab supplies, I mean, this is an extremely expensive uh, part of your overhead. These guys have worked with us to give us very good pricing, which we're extremely appreciative of. So we were able to, to decrease our manpower significantly, and, and you need to be able to do that in this day of, of this declining reimbursement. You can't be fat and, and happy. You, gotta, you have to really uh, be as efficient as you can. Uh, I can't say enough about this company. I mean, I've just been very impressed. They actually were kind enough to invite Randy and me to come over to Japan on their nickel, and this is their CEO. Uh, we call him Tack. And uh, he treated us like royalty. He actually picked us up at the airport. He took us to the hotel, picked us up from the hotel, took us through the train station. And all, I mean, it was really, we were treated absolutely like royalty over there. And we actually visited their uh, plant where they actually make these, uh, uh, these machines. And, and I can tell you, it is an absolutely, you could eat uh, off of these machines. You don't need a plate. It's so clean and pristine. It's, it's really extremely well done. So I can't really recommend them enough either. And Leica has been very helpful with us. And again, they're, they're helpful uh, with a lot of labs. This, this, this technology, this scanning is going to be very helpful for us in the future. This is a picture of Bob's uh, website. Again, I've already mentioned him. So go talk to him if you want to build something. Stat Labs website. And then uh, Aguilera. Again, these guys have been extremely helpful to us, as has Orion. So just can't say enough. And WinSurge also. Uh, this is a good uh, lab informatics service if you need one of those. Um, we were able to, to implement things that allowed us to, to track specimens, uh, barcoding, all this stuff is new, it's helpful, it's sort of high tech. Uh, these equipments that we've talked about before, I mean, we can turn things around a lot faster with a high quality uh, service. So this has really been, uh, we wouldn't have had this opportunity if we would have stayed where we were. So that's the good news, is when you start up from scratch, you can kind of put all the new technology in place. And our laboratory is, is a real-time lab. I mean, in the old days, we kind of had to batch everything together and say, okay, we're going to do all this now and all this later. We can do stuff all the time. And the way Randy outlined our lab is it's, it's done almost like uh, Henry Ford did with uh, the, uh, the, the Model T. I mean, st things start off here, they're received, and they end up in the immunoperoxidase, and they end up in our laboratory, in, our, in front of the microscope. So it moves like, almost like a conveyor belt. And that's not the way it was done in our other lab. It was more like a patchwork thing. It's, it's really very efficient, and it's working working very well. 
So these are going to be some things that we're going to introduce in the future. Um, you're going to hear Joel uh, Crockett of Dermatology Lab of Central States talk tomorrow about this ClearPath software. We're going to put some of this in at some point as well. This is extremely ex exciting uh, stuff, and, uh, and, that, and that's the good news about all this technology is that there are all these opportunities to do some really interesting things in the future. Um, strategic alliances. Uh, I mentioned this, and, and I don't know if Tom is in the room, but he's a very close friend of mine. Uh, we've known each other for, gosh, I don't know how many years before this guy was born, probably, uh, Michael Conroy and John Mode. Uh, but we have decided to form a, uh, not really, a, we're not acquiring each other. We're no longer in the corporate world, but we want to, like, put ourselves together so we can get best pricing on uh, negotiating managed care plans, negotiating pricing with supply companies, with, man with uh, uh, the uh, interface companies and that sort of thing. Uh, we've maintained our relationship with UT Southwestern. Uh, Travis uh, Vandergriff was here earlier. He's a former fellow of mine who's over there at UT. He's doing a great job over there teaching, and we work co uh, closely with him. Uh, I'm going to be taking over as chairman of dermatology at uh, Baylor Scott & White in 2016, so I'll have uh, dermatology residents to train, and I'm also getting trained uh, as an MBA to learn a little bit more about business now that I'm doing all this stuff. So, <laughs> so anyway, about our, our business, um, you know, we're basically dedicated to dermatopathology, and we're, we're based in Texas. Uh, we have both routine work that we do as well as consults. We've trained over 150 fellows. I'm honored to have a number of them here today. Very honored to have uh, uh, Dr. Ella, who was on the faculty with me here, as well as others. So and that's really been one of the most rewarding things I've done is to train fellows and residents. And uh, this is our website uh, here, and there you see Dr. Ella in the background. So this is our best picture that we had, so we want to include her in there. You've been here. We appreciate your coming. Next year, we're going to do it a little earlier in June, and uh, we're going to probably have some time for, uh, we're going to try to put in kind of a, uh, a, a, a some board review kind of stuff as well. So it'll be good for you guys who want to bone up on, uh, on boards and recertification. We have an annual uh, Durham Path uh, prep course in Dallas. The 6570 guys, usually from mostly around the, uh, Texas, come to this. And it's similar to what they do at the boards. Uh, we have uh, started a, a, a deal where a physician extenders come in and spend time in the office. So uh, I think I spoke to a gentleman earlier today. If you, if you have your ex extenders in your practice, you want to send them to us for a few days, learn about DermPath, especially if they're taking biopsies. They're welcome with us. Uh, we got this big room with all these heads. We need to fill it up. So we're, we're more than happy to have any of these guys at any time. Uh, and we also have people, if, if you want to come spend a week with us at the microscope and look at a lot of cases, uh, Javad, my former fellow, said he may come back and spend a little time with us. So uh, you're always welcome in our lab. We're, we view our lab as a, as a place that, that is welcoming. We want to have people show up. So uh, the other thing we're doing that's kind of cool is on the sixth floor, we're actually going to have a conference center. Uh, half that room is going to be uh, uh, something where we could actually have a conference like this in that room, maybe not as big as this, but uh, we could have about 100 people in that room. Uh, we're going to have a, a video unit like here and a screen that comes down, and we can have CME dinners with a catering kitchen. So eventually we'll be able to have that uh, in effect as well. So uh, in conclusion, uh, medicine and pathology ain't what it used to be. But the future is always uncertain. You've got to make a commitment, and you just can't ever look back. And, and you've got to be a visionary. You've got to work hard. But most of all, enjoy what you do and be grateful for what you have. So I really appreciate you all coming. I'm going to get you out of here a little bit early. I want you to go enjoy uh, the afternoon. Uh, and for those who want to stick around, uh, they're going to have a really good uh, product theater uh, from Genentech on their, their new drug, which is very exciting. Happy to answer any questions if anybody has. Uh, these guys are looking in on us out of our back door of our home up here, so there's a lot of deer up in this area. <laughs>